So it is our pleasure of all of us to have you here as a speaker and uh, Shippy will talk about some properties of stochastic gravitational wave background. Please. Okay, actually uh, also the title is uh, properties of stochastic gravitational wave background. I will focus on the induced gravitational waves. And, uh, some phenomenology attached to that like for multiple holes and uh, small scale uh, scalar perturbation or something like that. Uh, now I work in Kavli Apinu in the University of Tokyo, uh, but uh, as you can see that I am uh, working at home for almost uh, half a year because of this uh, virus stuff. So uh, I, I hope I can go back to Japan as soon as possible, otherwise my funding will be expired. Sorry, you are not in Yukawa anymore. I am in, but I'm working at home as you can see. I cannot go no, back I mean, to Japan. Your, your affiliation? Uh, it's uh, IBMU. Yeah. So but, you, you uh, have nothing to do with uh, Yukawa anymore? Uh, I, ha I have an affiliate uh, researcher, but uh, yeah, that's nothing, you know. Okay. But yeah, I'm moving to Institute for Theoretical Physics in CES Beijing uh, later this year. But yeah, that's enough for introduction. Uh, I uh, would like to thank Sinsan and all the organizers to give me the opportunity to introduce my recent work on the induced special wave stuff. So let me start. I will introduce a little bit on the yeah, stochastic background of gravitational wave. But uh, if you attend the amazing seminar on Monday, then uh, I can just quickly skip it. Now I talk about the phenomenology, about the promoted perversions and promoted by holes in the gravitational waves, and then to my recent work on the properties for in this gravitational wave, especially the scaling and the near peak behavior. So as everybody knows that uh, our universe is something like a bear like that, but uh, before 2015, and just this is the Planck 2015 data, we only know that everything come uh, behind the, uh, after this cosmic microwave background or a recombination of the optics and neutrinos. But uh, because of the high energy physics is very fruitful, but the uh, free part is so short that we cannot see it directly. Fortunately, we have gravitational waves now, and uh, it is possible for uh, us to detect the gravitational waves, especially the stochastic background in the generated in the, in the early universe to see what's happening over there for uh, the inflation, particle physics, even for the quantum fluctuations for the uh, pre-Big Bang stuff. Okay, this is the uh, signal that uh, LIGO first de detected as the gravitational burst from the inspiral black holes. Uh, and in the future, like uh, this is the most optimistic point of view in this interesting uh, website. You can draw all of these possible, maybe some of them are dead already, uh, the future gravity wave detectors. But according to all of these uh, uh, categories for the frequencies and the amplitude of the string, curvature string, we can uh, divide them into three different categories. Uh, ground or underground based gravitational wave detector, space uh, based detector, and the puzzle timings. Somebody call this a sky based detector. So currently, I only have LIGO, but uh, in the future, we at least we may have LISA and some uh, SK or Chinese FAST or something to detect all of the gravitational waves in uh, different frequencies with uh, different uh, uh, amplitudes. Uh, here I draw just some possible stochastic background of gravitational wave sources from the smallest to largest. We see the promoted gravitational wave from inflation. This is uh, the most optimistic uh, amplitude for the largest possible tensor to scale ratio from the Planck data. So more around amplitude around 10 to minus 15. If we're lucky enough, we may have it on BPO or DeSigo in the future. Otherwise, we have the first order phase transition uh, signal, which is a very uh, interesting for especially for the particle phenomenology guys and the I will focus on the induced gravitational waves later uh, in my talk and also we believe that there must be incoherent superposition for gravitational waves of binaries as we have already seen the binaries but uh, the amplitude of this incoherent superposition is unknown. So for instance this is from a uh, science paper uh, we'll give us Sorry, a very interesting may I ask something? Uh, yeah Sorry, sorry to interrupt. So, um, can you go two slides back? Uh, one more, please. 
so this stochastic background is i mean so this is always considered considered to be the inflationary gravitational waves or is just what generally what is detected and the uh, inflation and gra gravitational waves are sh thought to be a part of this? Uh, I think this one is from inflationary uh, primordial tensor provision. And uh, you may have some others, like for instance, the supermassive binaries is uh, uh, something, I think it's around here or something. You have the uh, many, many binaries in the universe with different uh, distances and different uh, mass ratios. And they, they can generate from uh, they can generate the gradual waves from uh, uh, different uh, uh, directions and the red shifts, but because their uh, amplitude is so small that we cannot detect them individually, but they, they form this stochastic background. That's uh, mm -hmm. something else from, from the inflationary background. You have some other things. I, I will talk about this later. As you can see that the first order phase transition is another thing. It is induced gradual wave is connected to, but not the uh, inflationary uh, 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 gravitational wave. And also, this is what I talked about just now. The, uh, from the binaries, we may have stochastic background. Is that clear? Okay, okay, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. okay. Let's uh, continue. So, uh, this is from the Kulayagi's paper, and uh, we have the uh, 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 primordial gravitational wave from, from inflation which spans for a huge range of the frequencies. Here I just draw a little bit of, of that. This is the uh, quark gluon phase transition, but the, the amplitude is too small, it's difficult to, to detect. But uh, if we can see the CMB B mode polarizations on uh, the large scales, it can be seen as some indirect uh, detection of the primordial gravitational wave from, from inflation. So now we have the bicep CAC array, and the Chinese RCPT and the Japanese uh, project of Lightbird, or many uh, so-called uh, CMB stage four detectors for the B mode polarizations. And for uh, the future plan of the cycle BBO, if it's, we are lucky enough, we can see the uh, uh, frequency of reheating, or uh, in the optimistic case, we can see directly the primordial gravitational waves. Also, as I commented, we have the uh, stochastic background of gravitational waves from the binary neutron stars and binary black holes. And uh, this, is, this result is well known, and the, the waveform is uh, very easy to, to derive. And we believe, for instance, you can see the paper of Ifan and uh, the, uh, the collaborators, that uh, we may have such kind of things, which is consistent with the current merger rate uh, set by LIGO. And maybe it can be detected in the future just by uh, the uh, uh, more runs of LIGO. And also, I will comment a little bit on the uh, first order of phase transition generated gravitational waves. Uh, in this case, you can see from this, this is uh, got from uh, Caprini's paper, that uh, we have different power laws. And it's possible that we have the uh, two peak uh, structure, which is one of from the bubble collision and the other one from the sound waves, which uh, uh, has a very uh, Kind of a short distance to mark the characteristic size of a bubble and the characteristic size of the eddies in the, the sound waves. And finally, uh, I will main, mainly focus on the uh, induced gravitational waves, which has also very fruit phenomenology, and uh, together with the primordial black hole formation. So, what is going on for the primordial black hole and the uh, induced gravitational wave? So I know that uh, from CMB, we can reconstruct the primordial scalar perturbation uh, like this. From the CMB anisotropy, we may have the anisotropy like that. And uh, by the reconstruction, we can have the primordial power spectrum of the so-called curvature perturbation, uh, something like this. But uh, you have to know that we can only reconstruct the power spectrum of the curvature perturbation for a finite range of uh, wave numbers or frequencies, whatever. This is because the resolution of the Planck uh, detector is limited. And other than this, like uh, four to five orders of the uh, wave number range, we do not have any constraints. So it's the lack of constraints on, on small scales. We may guess that it just go like that, but it's also possible that this doesn't go like that. What if there is some features or enhancement on small scales? 
the reason we consider that is because they have such kind of pics can have very really interesting uh, phenomenology uh, uh, as the uh, so-called induced gradual wave and the promoted black hole. Uh, if we consider a nonlinear perturbation theory of general relativity, we can have two uh, uh, kind of a scalar perturbation or curvature perturbation and generate one um, tensor perturbation. And this kind of tensor perturbation, once uh, going inside the horizon, we can observe these so-called induced quantum waves. And this induced quantum wave can be constrained, as I talked about, by the current and the future uh, gravitational wave detectors. On the other hand, by the gravitational coll collapse, uh, once such kind of a peak, the scale, characteristic scale of such peaks re enter the horizon in the radiation of matter dominated universe, maybe radiation dominated universe or something, then uh, it will collapse into the promoted black holes if it is large enough. Again, these promoted black holes can be constrained by many uh, observational uh, uh, experiments. I will talk about the formation of promoted black hole and the constraints currently. Yeah, by the way, these two things can be cross-checked and most can be used to detect the small scale property of the scalar uh, perturbation. So what is the mechanism of deformation for promoted black holes? Let's suppose that there is a peak, which is a, a much larger than what it is on large scales for the primordial scalar perturbation. Then after the, this mod uh, was stretched out of the horizon, it was a constant, but then it re-entered the horizon. At the re-entering, if this peak is large enough, then they, there will be some immediate uh, gravitational collapse uh, to form a, a promoted black hole for the uh, entire uh, Hubble scale, for entire Hubble patch. The masses of order, the total mass in, in the Hubble patch. And uh, we can calculate from this uh, so-called high Gaussian peaks for the abundance of the promoted black hole formation at the formation time. And after that, it will decay a little bit because uh, in the radiation dominant universe, and then uh, uh, not decay, uh, increase a little, sorry, because it's uh, the background is radiation dominated and the promoted black hole is a matter. Then in the matter dominated universe, it's uh, the uh, kind of a fraction stays the same. So I draw it like this. Then we can uh, define another parameter of this so-called promoted black hole mass function, which is the uh, energy density of the promoted black hole divided uh, by, normalized by the uh, cold dark matter energy density. So it's something connected to the uh, uh, higher peak formation rate beta by a very large number and proportional to some power of the mass. So this is what I said. You have a Gaussian distribution, uh, then uh, you have a higher order peak. If it's larger than some critical value, then it will collapse into promoted black hole. But the key point is that if we only consider a CMB scale promoted scalar proportion, it is like around 10 to minus 5. And you can calculate, and we found that this number of the, the promoted black hole for, uh, formation rate is extremely small. So it's completely negligible. So to have the uh, a substantial promoted black holes to have uh, observable effects, we may have a larger uh, scalar provision on small scale. Because it's on small scale, there is no constraint, so it's possible. And in this case, for instance, we want promoted black hole to be world dark matter, then uh, FPBH is one. Then we uh, derive it back. We can have the, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, higher peak, we can find the uh, variance of such a, a distribution function of this uh, scalar provision like this. This is much larger than 10 to minus 5. So we have to say that uh, you must have a much, much larger or mechanism of enhancement for the scalar provision. OK. Here is something I would like to say later, but uh, let me just mention that uh, the Gaussianity of the distribution function of the uh, scalar provision or density provision is very important in calculating such kind of things. But uh, if you have non Gaussianity, for instance, you have a, a positive non Gaussianity of the uh, local shape, uh, as is studied by Young and Ben's paper, and uh, you can find that it's very, uh, you have a very uh, great enhancement on the uh, high sigma tails of, of the uh, non Gaussian distribution. So, in this case, if you still 
uh, require that the variance of the uh, distribution function is 10 to minus 5, then this enhancement makes the information of primitive too, house too large. So you have to suppress it by requiring the, the uh, PBH uh, mass function to be around 1. And in this case, to uh, invoke the non-Gaussianity, you have to suppress uh, the variance of the uh, non-Gaussian distribution here. I will come back to this point later. So how to constrain the promotable host? I will not talk about this small promotable host, which has already evaporated by the current cosmic age, but uh, I will talk about the larger promotable host, which can uh, be some remnant of such mechanism, which will have uh, interesting observational constraints later. The parameter here is the energy density of promotable hole, normalized by the dark matter. And uh, for different masses of such black holes, we have different constraints and the uh, accuracy is different. So you, you may have some place like here, you do not have any constraints. And uh, for different masses, you may have different phenomenology, attack matter, prime mind, the LIGO detection, and some something like this. Uh, in here, you may have the uh, Hawking radiation induced vacuum decay, or you have the structure formation if the promoted by hole is too large, something, something. But I, in this uh, talk, I will mainly focus on the dark matter uh, assumption and uh, the uh, LIGO detection as well as the dark matter, as well as the promoted by holes. So this is the constraint from the LIGO group. They found that uh, you cannot have any uh, subsolar mass from uh, black hole detection, which can put some bound on here. And they claim that uh, if you go to uh, version five, then you may have an increase two orders of magnitude from here to here, which is good. But now we know that in 2001, 2000, uh, 2020 and January, we found the detection of a, a kind of a solar mass black hole binary. Uh, in this case, uh, if it is promoted, then it's something like here, but uh, currently it, uh, it implies that it's not probable to be promoted because the uh, spin is a, a, a statistics is a little bit different. Anyway, so for the O1 and O2 uh, events, we can always uh, require that these are all promoted. And uh, in this case, we can reconstruct the promoted black hole mass function like this. Uh, as is done in uh, uh, my, uh, my paper with my collaborators. And recently there is a, a very uh, good paper by De Luca uh, uh, to have a kind of a review on, on all of this scenario of how to uh, 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 deal with the promodial black hole as LIGO events uh, assumption. And in this intermediate mass range, we have many constraints from the lenses especially the uh, lensing from the spiral HSC, which is uh, also led by the IPMU. And uh, they found some kind of a candidates like asteroid mass. So which means that you do not have this infinite uh, exclusion for the curves. So this leaves some space for the plant in mind here. But uh, the most important thing is that uh, this is going to end in a few years because they propose to uh, uh, observe the sky by this lensing, uh, by Subaru, as you see, as a micro lensing uh, in, uh, in the next few years. And uh, whether this is a promotable hole or not will soon be uh, verified or first verified. Uh, another interesting part is that uh, there is a window here that uh, there is no any constraints. So you can see it from here. This is the previous result. Yeah. So this is the uh, curve in their uh, first version of their paper. At that moment, they didn't take into account the so-called uh, finite size effect and the wave effect. So this actually the overestimate the power of the uh, exclusion. But uh, later on, uh, people realized that you have to take the, the uh, finite size effect, which means that the promoter black hole is so small that uh, the uh, kind of lensing experiment should uh, not be uh, uh, trusted. And then you, you cut this such kind of curve. So to leave a window uh, around here, then uh, you may have promodule black hole as well dark matter uh, like this. The, I think there are so many papers on that. I, I noticed that tomorrow also I will give a talk on such kind of scenarios. And for instance, uh, we had a paper on the construct the uh, promodule black hole formation from the Stolopinski R squared inflation. Uh, you have a Stolopinski R squared inflation on large scales, which can fit for the data for plant constraints, like here. 
but on small scales, it goes the other way, and uh, uh, the uh, inflation is dominated by another uh, scalar field, and the transition part can generate some uh, enhancement of the promotive scalar perturbation that can generate the promotive holes as well as dark matter. So now I will turn to the induced Gaussian wave part. Uh, either this way. Just now we talk about this way. Now we go to the new square wave part. So it's the same figure, but uh, now as the peak re-enter the horizon, and if you go to the nonlinear level with general relativity, you have a coupling from two scalars and one tensor. So you have the Gaussian wave induced pendant uh, in this manner. So you have the metric like this. So the scalar scalar probation and the tensor probation. And in that way, and the surface strikes. And then you can see that the tensor equation of motion of the tensor provision is sourced by the convolution of two scalar provisions. And this is the promodule, then it times the transfer function squared. And this can be solved by the green function method. So it's the convolution of the two scalar provision times the uh, time evolution of the uh, green function, something like this. Then the general uh, result for the energy density parameter or the uh, gravity wave spectrum, omega GW is something like this, is two-point function of uh, the tensor uh, perturbation and the four-point function of the scalar perturbation, which is uh, proportional to the square of the power spectra of the scalar perturbation and the square of the uh, curvature perturbation. In the region of the universe, this, uh, there is only one order one parameter between these two. So this is the, the reason why we have that. And then you can have the cross check of the induced Gaussian wave and the promodule black hole abundance. So as I said, omega GW is proportional to the square of the curvature perturbation uh, spectrum squared, something like this. And uh, in the previous study, I already know that the promodule black hole abundance, the FPBH is proportional to beta and uh, times uh, some kind of error function uh, of the uh, something like this. And the uh, denominator of the error function uh, it can be written in a way of the, the square root of the uh, curvature perturbation spectrum. This is actually the variance. You have to get the window function and so on, but let's just write in this way. So these two things are identical to each other. Then you can have a, a cross check for the uh, induced Gaussian wave amplitude by the Gaussian wave detectors and the uh, experiments constraints from the uh, primordial black hole and bundles. So I like that. This is the so-called uh, cross check of two experiments. So for different uh, mass range of the primordial black hole, it can be like uh, dark matter here, uh, for 10 to the minus 16 solar mass. And for uh, solar masses, it's uh, LIGO detection. They uh, correspond to different frequencies of the induced Gaussian wave, which we, we may have different uh, experiments. Uh, there is a very good coincidence that uh, this mass window of dark matter is really just in the laser range, a little bit uh, to the left. But the LIGO as uh, events as promoted black hole is right in the other time area range. And we'll talk about this coincidence and how to use them to constrain data later. So let's go to non-Gaussianity. So for the Gaussian case, it's very easy that we have this and we have this, and the, these two things are the same. But for non-Gaussian non -Gaussian case, we have uh, some more uh, degree of freedom. Like for the simplest uh, local shape non-Gaussianity, we have uh, something like this, just derived the, to the second order. Then uh, uh, it's easy to see that the uh, gravitational wave spectrum uh, can be uh, expanded like in this way. So you have a, a power spectra of the curvature perturbation squared, cubed, and four. And the FNI also to the four. And this, how to uh, solve this uh, uh, kind of curvature perturbation is already done by the Young and Pan's paper. So I have cited that paper before. So you have these two formula. Uh, but I have to mention that FNL is positive can can enhance the promoted by formation. So I just I will take the positive numbers in. Now what will happen? So you already have the promoted black hole as well dark matter model here, and uh, if you can induce or uh, the have the induced Gaussian wave from that, 
as I said, there is a coincidence that the frequency is in the LISA uh, range. And uh, if you do the calculation, you found that it's very interesting that it's well above this uncertainty curve. Everything is, is fine. And if you consider also the non-gaussianity, uh, if uh, in, non-gaussianity is enhanced, then uh, this uh, gravitational uh, promoted black hole is mainly dominated by the non-Gaussian part, uh, the non-linear part of the whole In this case, the gravitational wave uh, uh, is also uh, enhanced a little bit, but the enhancing, enhancing rate is different. I mean, uh, the enhancement of the promoted black hole abundance is much larger as I, I, I draw here. So in this case, you have to decrease uh, the uh, variance of the um, scalar population probability distribution function to make sure that you do not break uh, the constraints of f of pbh is smaller than one. So for gravitational wave side, you have a smaller uh, power spectra for the curvature evolution, which means that this decreases, but you have an increase of the f angle. So you combine this together, the final result, uh, interestingly, is that uh, the amplitude of the induced gravitational will, will decrease as you increase the non gaussianity and you increase the non gaussian to a limit where the uh, uh, curvature position is purely dominated by the non gaussian term, which is like a chi-square uh, uh, statistics because this is a, a kind of random variable square. There is a limit which is where above the least sensitivity curve. So this is a very interesting result, which means that if promoted black hole can serve as all dark matter here, and this is the only window you can you can move it a little bit, then the peak move it a little bit, but uh, the uh, limit is uh, always uh, above the sensitivity curve. So then uh, we actually prove that the induced gravity must be detectable by LISA. So this is uh, independent of uh, the amplitude and the Gaussian and linear parameter induced. And there is a byproduct that we study such scenario in in the uh, promoted black holes LIGO events. So we can reconstruct from the LIGO events to the promoted black hole mass function, which is picked here and with this width, this is like a 17 solar mass. I forgot what it is, but yeah. And you calculate the non-Gaussian, uh, the uh, induced gravitational wave like this. And you found that this is already been uh, excluded by the positive, current positive timing array. This is wrong, it should be uh, here. You, you can see that there is some overlap, but you cannot, you haven't seen that in the current positive timing array constraint, which is bad, but uh, unless there is a non gaussianity as I said. If you have non gaussianity then the amplitude is suppressed and you can evade this uh, constraint from a positive timing array. But finally, there will be a limit that uh, you will have a, a, a limit where above the future positive time error experiments for the SKA constraints. So here comes my uh, recent work on uh, the scaling of the induced gravitational wave and the near peak behavior. So again, I, I will focus on, on the induced gravitational wave here. Uh, the infrared scaling thing However, it doesn't uh, depend on the source of the uh, uh, stochastic background of Gaussian wave. This is the only part in, in my talk that is independent of the uh, physical source of the Gaussian waves. Uh, you have different sources, but everything is the same if you go infrared enough. You have this so-called uh, uh, universal infrared scaling of frequency cube, as well as this uh, uh, frequency is uh, where about all the scales of the source time and it re-entered the horizon in the relation to the universe. I have a very simple way to explain it. Uh, I think I still have enough time, so I can I can do that. So uh, this is the uh, equality. This is the uh, convolving uh, Hubble horizon. You have two modes. This is the modes of the scalar peak, and this is the, the mode which is uh, uh, infrared to the peak of the scale mode. And you, you want to study the gravitational wave uh, spectrum on, on this uh, wave number or frequency mode. So at this time, you have something like this. This is a gravitational wave a spectrum at the equality. So it's it's around here. Sorry, sorry for the confusion, but it's <laughs> around here. Because uh, 
the uh, uh, tensor modes decays as one or a uh, in the when the re-enter horizon. So it uh, must be decayed from the uh, horizon re-entering value of this. You have a kind of factor of a over here, and this k squared is uh, from the definition of the uh, omega GW. You know that is from k squared of the orthogonal or, or whatever. If it's a value less than everything has this k squared. And the k-squared will be cancelled if you consider horizon crossing condition here. Then uh, actually you have something like this. And outside the horizon, you have the conservation of the tensor modes. So it will be connected to the, its value at the uh, horizon crossing of the k-star mode immediately. And then you use the Poisson distribution statistics, a smaller uh, scale modes uh, are large, uh, on larger wavelengths and the uh, uh, modes on the smaller wavelengths. You have a, a relation of the KQ. And this kind of thing, re after re enter horizon, decays uh, uniformly as Z1 one, one over A. So it just decays to the omega HW on the peak frequency. So you can see that these two things are connected by this way, but there is a kind of a KQ behavior which reflects the uh, kind of person distribution nature on the super horizon scale. So we uh, reached the conclusion of this. And now I will talk about uh, my other work, which appeared on, on archive today. So it's uh, uh, basically it's the so-called analytic formula for the induced Gaussian wave. Uh, in this case, uh, we know that the induced Gaussian wave uh, usually is from uh, the peak or the curvature perturbation. So you may have some other forms of curvature perturbation, like scale invariant curvature perturbation, or the curvature perturbation with many, many peaks. But uh, basically, uh, from uh, uh, the uh, one peak, single peak enhancement is the most general. If you look at all of the, the papers which can uh, generate such enhancement on small scales. So uh, in this paper, we start with a log normal peak like this. So this is the power spectrum of the curvature perturbation of the log normal peak. And this AOR is the uh, uh, normalization. So if you integral this by the d log k, then you have the AOR. Uh, everything is fine. If this delta goes to zero, then this goes to the delta function peak, which is also very frequently used. But here I will consider the finite width of the uh, log normal peak like this. In, th in this figure, I consider delta is uh, 0 0.01. So the peak is like this. So by this uh, calculation procedure I talked about just now, we can easily have the numerical integral of or the green function and the convolution of two scalar perturbations to have the final result of the uh, Gaussian wave spectrum uh, divided by, uh, normalized by the amplitudes of the scalar perturbation squared. Uh, this is uh, something that I uh, calculate in the radiation dominant universe. It will be connected to the observational uh, value today uh, for uh, you have to times the uh, uh, radiation uh, portion of the uh, energy density, but let's forget about that right now. I, I, I focus on the shape of the scale of, of the induced gravity wave spectrum. So you can see that from this infinitely a uh, smaller uh, peak, the delta function peak, it is this, this gray curve like here. But if you have a, a finite function, finite peak of the 0.1 here then uh, it's something like this. They are basically similar on the, uh, their uh, kind of a peak, around peak behavior, but you can see that the, the infrared scaling is completely different. This is the uh, frequency uh, cube, as I talked about just now, but here we have the frequency squared. This is a well-known result. So why, well, why do we have this? Uh, the key point is that uh, you have another uh, scale of delta. Delta, uh, the scale of delta is very important. Uh, we, after some calculation, we have uh, analytical results of this. So this uh, finite with uh, induced gradual wave is connected to the uh, induced gradual from the delta function peak by an error function of something like this. So you can see that this analytical result is the dashed red uh, fist result well. And by this re uh, uh, formula and this result here, we found a very interesting uh, result that uh, we have a peak frequency of the alpha p here. We have a break frequency of b here. 
which marks the uh, difference of the uh, scaling and the inferred power around here, then uh, this peak of the narrow uh, peak in the curvature position is really uh, the ratio of these two. So you can just calculate uh, the uh, 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 width, narrow width of the uh, scalar perturbation induced gravitation wave by, by this. So once you observe the induced gravitation wave in this strip, like for instance, you have a double peak here and you have a, a break frequency, then uh, you can use these two frequencies to get the uh, uh, width of the narrow peak. This is the, the narrow case. So what will happen for the broad peak case? By broad, I mean uh, not very, very large, much larger than one, but uh, it's uh, around one or a little bit larger than one, because it's much larger than one is not physical. As you know, you, you can see here, delta goes to ten is already quite like a scale invariant spectrum. Um, of course, you can just go to delta goes to infinity, which can fit the uh, uh, re previous result with the uh, induced square wave from scalar scale invariant uh, scalar provision quite well. But now let's just consider. Uh, these things like this, and uh, for uh, for this kind of a scalar probation, you can have the induced square wave like this. So, do we uh, can we have any analytical form for that? Because as I know, they are um, calculate this kind of thing by the Markov integrals. Which, uh, if you want to compare with the observational data, then it's not very good. So, let's, let's start from delta equals to two. So we have a scalar provision like this, and uh, the uh, shape of the scalar provision is like this. Then from a numerical integral, you have the induced quantum uh, spectrum like this. So then I have uh, uh, some calculation. I get the very long uh, kind of analytical formula for the uh, induced quantum. Uh, this different color means a different part. Let me just explain it a little bit uh, carefully. So this pink one is the so-called the super horizon contribution, which is the pink test curve here. And uh, this uh, blue one is the near horizon contribution, is the blue test line here. And the purple one is the sub horizon contribution. This horizon means the uh, moment when the peak of the scalar proportion re-enter the horizon. So at that moment, when this peak of the uh, peak horizon is this F star or K star, or whatever, or when it re enters the horizon, the or of the modes that uh, has a wavelength larger than that, the super horizon modes uh, contributes to, to this curve, and the uh, near horizon around the horizon uh, contributes to this curve, and the sub horizon modes contributes to this curve. Oh, very good. So if we add these together, then we have a perfect uh, analytical formula for the induced gravity from arbitrary uh, value of the, the mode like this. And also, we try to construct uh, the approximation for that, because uh, this is very important, uh, because we usually, we only see uh, the peak uh, by the interferometer or in the future, right? So we also try to uh, get the, the most important contributions in the near peak behavior. This is from the near peak horizon behavior like this, uh, and uh, the near peak contribution from the sub-horizon MOS. This one is uh, negligible at the near peak um, frequency, so you just neglect it. And we have a fitting formula of this uh, analytical result. It's not the uh, fitting for the numerical integral, but uh, some kind of approximation from this uh, long uh, formula. And we have something like this, which is very uh, fits very well, you can see. And uh, from this, we can have the maximum value for the induced square wave spectrum, which is around the uh, one eighth of the a squared or delta squared, which is good. And also we have the uh, width of the peak, which is uh, delta over square root of two. This square root of two is very, has a very easy uh, physical explanation. It, because the induced square wave is so-called secondary, you have the two scalar provisions and one tensor provision. So you have uh, this contribution of this peak is mainly around the so-called near horizon contribution, which means that the three uh, wavelengths is uh, equal to each other of the same order at least. So then you can just combine these two peaks of the scalar provision together. Uh, the scalar provision has a, a, a width of, uh, of this, uh, a form of this. So you have two of this and this, this two just dies away. And you, you can see that this uh, peak width is just delta over square root. So very good. 
So in the future, if, uh, uh, of course, as I said, you have to amplify uh, multiple this to the uh, uh, some kind of numerical factor, like 10 minus 5 or something, to connect to the current uh, observational data for the uh, question wave. But in the future, if this kind of thing is observed, uh, then you can immediately read out uh, the uh, maximum value from maximum value and the width to the uh, width of the peak and the uh, power spectrum, uh, uh, the amplitude of the cur uh, scalar perturbation. And this kind of thing usually, as I said, can be cross-checked by the promoted black hole uh, constraints. So you can uh, cross-check these two and see uh, fruit of physics from, from more of the result. Okay, so now here is the summary. Uh, the, as I said, the new square wave is one of the most important scientific goals for next generation gravity wave detectors. This uh, together with the primordial black hole physics can give us uh, some fruitful information on the small scale scalar perturbation power spectrum and so on and so forth. And uh, I introduced some of my uh, personal interest. So the first one is the uh, induced gravity wave and the primordial black hole dark matter. Uh, we proved that if uh, primordial black holes can serve as all dark matter, then we must see the, its uh, correspondence induced gravity wave on the uh, space-based gravity wave detectors. Also, if the induced gravity wave uh, if they are uh, from all of the uh, LIGO events uh, or the promoted by holes, then uh, corresponding in this way with this in conflation is the current VDA data, which means that uh, either they are not all of them are promoted or we have to introduce non sanity. And also the, for the shape of the in this show, as I uh, talked uh, carefully just now, that uh, we derive some formula for the narrow and the uh, uh, broad peaks for the uh, induced gravity wave from the scalar provision. And if you have this uh, uh, observed such kind of a signals in the future, uh, then we can immediately read uh, the uh, physical parameters from this uh, uh, analytical formula. And also, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Guillaume's talk next, which is uh, the next one. He will talk about the induced gravity wave in the universe field with arbitrary equational state. And uh, in that case, we may have some uh, more interesting things. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Let's you. thank the speaker again. So we have lots of questions and maybe Tassinata first. Yeah, hello, thanks for the nice talk. I have two very short questions. One, you shown that there is a big difference for your uh, induced gravitational wave profile. For small delta, you have a sort of dip towards no, the peak. Yeah, something like, something like this. Something like this. Yes. Do you understand why it is so and when? At, when does it disappear? For which values of delta? Oh, yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, in the previous papers, people usually say that uh, you have some, uh, this is a resonance peak. So it's a resonance enhancement, then you have resonance uh, disconstruct disconstruction, something like that. So, but I prefer to say that uh, these two things are kind of individual thing. You have a kind of a, a, a resonance peak around here, and you have another uh, part of the uh, uh, scalar uh, gravity wave. Uh, it's just like this. If you do not have any resonance, then this peak just stays away. So you don't have it. Okay. So, so in this case, this is a, a kind of a, this deep uh, marks the nature of the uh, difference, physical difference of these two peaks. Perfect. Uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah, because you can, you can perfectly see it in uh, Guillaume's talk, because we'll talk about some uh, universe without any resonance, because the sound speed of the scalar provision and tensor provision are the same. So in that case, you don't have this. You only have one peak of it. Okay. And thanks. your second, your second question: When did this uh, disappear? Uh, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't show. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, I show it here. So you can see that it's uh, this is like a one over two. Uh, it's already yeah. barely seen. So uh, just uh, uh, this delta is like uh, we we checked that the uh, delta is like zero point four something like yes. that, then this, uh, this disappears. This is already disappeared because you can see that this dip is yes. already higher than uh, the other peak. Yes. Yeah. So you can you can take this uh, just one half as okay. the characteristic scale when the dip disappears. 
Okay, thanks. Thank you for the question. Short question from Chunshan. Oh, oh yes. Uh, um, I, I would like to ask for this induced gravitational wave, this uh, gravitational wave for propagator, which many data with a scalar loop. Um, okay. We know that at a sub horizon scale, the, the scalar perturbation always uh, decays slower than tensor perturbation. So does that mean this loop is always dominate? I mean, does, does, does that mean this uh, diagram always uh, dominate over the gravitational wave uh, two point function without scalar loop? Oh, you mean the primordial scalar provision? Yes, yes. Uh, because from, uh, the tens from the tensor provision, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, primordial. I mean, we have a two diagram. One is uh, um, this two point function of a tensor mode without loop. Another one is with loop. But because mm -hmm. of this uh, scalar mode, it always decays slower at sub horizon scale compared to gravitational wave. So does that mean that this uh, the diagram with scalar loop always dominate over uh, the two point function of a tensor mode without loop? Uh, which is a uh, what is the uh, the the diagram without loop? Can you can you repeat? Uh, just just uh, just this uh, um, uh, two tensor mode without scalar. Ah, uh, just just two tensor modes like this. Yeah, just a free propagating. Propagating. Uh, just yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah yeah. So does uh, that mean uh, this induced the gravitational wave always dominant? Uh. First of all, you have to consider the initial condition for them. The uh, uh, primordial tensor perturbation is usually much uh, suppressed than this if, if this is a, a from a, a peak or a, a smaller scale, right? Okay. If uh, yeah, if you don't consider the, the peak, but you consider the uh, induced gravity from the CMB scale uh, scalar provision, then uh, this kind of induced gravity is, is negligible. But if you want to talk about the time evolution, uh, let me yeah, see. That's what I mean. When you consider the time no, evolution, I, I think, and I think, they, are, scale, I think and they, then... they are the same. I think they are the same. They, they, both of them decay as a, a one over A in that case. Because you, because the source term here, yeah. If you if you look at uh, if you look at this uh, equation, it's a little bit misleading yeah, because you can see that this this may decay faster. But uh, the transfer function has also a time derivative and a special derivative, which can compensate the one over a in some sense. So the final result of the, the decay inside the horizon is it, the same as the, the usual gravity wave. So you, you mean this uh, scalar mode uh, decay um, in the same speed, as, in the same rate as the gravitational wave in sub horizon scale? Uh, is that I, your point? I'm talking about this. I'm talking about this. Yeah, this one decays uh, the same as one or eight. Can, can I say something that maybe helps? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's uh, so it, there are two different processes. One is the tensor mode generated during inflation, wow. right? And then in this case, this loop is of leading, and then the process that ship is talking about happens much later after inflation, and there is no leading term, so the I, there is no edge edge directly, so you need this. The loop is the first contribution. And then you are comparing these two contributions, the one from inflation and the one from the radiated dominated universe. OK, I'm not, I'm not sure if this helps, but 